the, the one of the things hanging over the Cowboys now is Ezekiel Elliott. Will he get suspended? You've got some information on this. Well, I would be shocked if he wasn't suspended, Colin. I mean, based on all the information, a couple sources close to the situation, like I think it's it's going to come down. If you look at what is the, um, the suspension for domestic violence, um, that being six games, you know, I think the Cowboys are going to miss him for multiple weeks to start out the season. Wow. I would be more shocked if he wasn't suspended. You know, it's interesting. Dak's a young kid. How You know, take me to what you think that's like when that news comes down. How does that fall on his teammates? How do they perceive him? Are they angry at him? Well, I think that when you're with the team, the team knows more information. So the coaching staff will start to prepare people and prepare other guys to be able to fill that gap. Um, just like New England, they were able to do with uh, Jimmy Garoppolo when Tom was suspended. And... Cowboys offensive players and the defensive players will say, you know, we're not a one man team. So that will kind of be their rallying cry. They might be a little more play action and pass dominant than they would be as a running football team. Say right now they run at 60 to 65%. I could see that flipping with Dak going into a second year with the receiving core and the tight end that they have. But each guy picking up a little bit of the slack when Zeke is absent from the team. Chris Carter making news here. He would be surprised, according to his sources, if Zeke was not suspended four to six games. You have a very unique uh, relationship, and I've said this before. In my years of doing this, um, I've met few players who are not only as good as broadcasters but are so connected to the sports industry, and you have a relationship with Odell Beckham. And we had some good, good decision discussions this week on a show you used to help us on speak for yourself about being the highest-paid player. And I, and I said to Jason Whitlock, our friend, I said, listen, we have to also recognize that Odell now is easily the most compelling merchandise mover in the city of New York, the most powerful city in the country. And the Mara family cannot just deny that exists. Mm -hmm. You can't just say that doesn't matter. Of Listen, the Clippers keep re-signing Blake Griffin because he sells tickets. So take me into the mind of, of Odell Beckham saying he wants to be the highest paid player. How do you think this ends up? What, what's this year going to look like? Well, I don't think this is going to be a bad year. I think that what he has done is, and, and I've tried to express to him, that you have to kind of control the narrative around what people say about you. So you can't be just like any other athlete and give the vanilla answers or the typical line and answers to questions. Like, if you think not being the highest paid receiver is enough for you, then you should say that. And he believes that. So now the Giants know, because it's kind of a landmark, that even if we offer him a contract where he makes more than Julio Jones or the other receivers at the top, um, Antonio Brown, then that's still not going to be enough for him. So you've also uh, gotten a little warning shot that it could be a long negotiation. Odell will have a great season. We've never seen a receiver come out with three seasons like he had. I'm looking for season number four to be the best season. He's more prepared mentally and physically how people are going to attack him. And he has a very good quarterback in Eli Manning and supporting cast being around him that this will be the biggest year of his career. So it will be exciting. The Giants and the Mara family, they know what they have. Um, they know they're going to have to pay him a lot of money. Um, he won't be the highest paid player in the league when they do sign him. But I look for him to spend a great deal of his career in New York, if not his whole career, with the Giants. Interesting. Uh, near the end of your career, um, middle to end, uh, the Vikings bring in Randy Moss. So you have been a legend and a star, and a team then drafts somebody that maybe people think is going to supplant the star. So Jimmy Garoppolo now is seen as the heir apparent to Tom Brady. Tom's fighting. He won't give him snaps in practice. Like, how, how do you think this, all this stuff about Jimmy G and contract, do you think Tom listens, cares, hears it? Does it, does he, does it matter to him? Well, why does Tom keep saying that I want to play four to six years? Even though his wife even came on the record and said that she didn't want Tom to continue playing. So I spend about the same amount of time as Tom Brady does thinking about Jimmy G and him replacing me. Zero. <laughs> All right. Tom keeps sending the message out there. I want to play four to six years. So why would I be concerned? I'm not supposed to groom the next quarterback for the New England Patriots. 
Tom is focused on the things he should be focused on, trying to get Super Bowl number six, trying to get this team, which is the most talented team that he's played on New England since 2007 in a championship position, get them home field advantage. Whenever Jimmy G plays, that's someone else's decision, and I know Tom Brady spends zero time thinking about it. You, um, I would imagine you know Tom Herman because he was the offensive coordinator at Ohio State. So you know Tom, right? Oh yeah. So Tom Herman yes. came out yesterday. I was ge- I was guessing this. Your your uh, co-host on First Things First, Nick Wright, had a pushback with him a couple years on radio that we played. And Tom is like a lot of good coaches at the college level, especially a little bit of a control freak. Uh, we, we've seen that with Saban. Frank Martin's a hell of a basketball coach at South Carolina. He's yelling and screaming. Mm-hmm. We've seen Bo, Woody Hayes and, you know, a lot of these Frank Cush at the college level, Bob Huggins yelling and screaming and power hungry. It, it controlling works. Um, I want your perspective um, and, and kind of our gateway to this is Tom Herman, but you played with a variety of coaches. You were a great motivated player. How does the controlling coach work in your eyes? Well, football is a different sport, and I believe it's not meant for all men to play the game. And the way the game has to be coached, it has to be coached with with an intensity and also a volume that is not like the other sports are taught. So I think it takes very, very special people, not only to play the game of football, but to be able to teach the game. Because at the end of the day, a football coach is a teacher. So how do the students assimilate the information, that being athletes, that being a lot of guys from a lot of different cultures. How do they assimilate and learn information? And for me, being a nice guy or someone verbally who can't communicate, it's hard to be successful and be a a NFL coach or a football coach, be in college or high school because of the intensity for which the game is coached. Now, Tony Dungy, I spent a lot of time with him. Yeah. Now, Tony Dungy doesn't use profanity, but he's intense. And also, which is more important, he's demanding. And he can do that without yelling and without using profanity. That's the art form that Tony Dungy, that he perfected as a coach. Also, knowing his personality, that he would be out of character. So a lot of volatile coaches have been attracted to football. I love people who have passion over what they know and what they do. So I'm not going to say that, no, we should reel these guys in. And I know that as a football player, I love playing the game and being coached if being yelled at or however that came to me, if it was going to make me better, I was willing to accept that because I knew it, it made me better. And I know it's a part of, learning as a football player and as a young football player, you're going to get yelled at. I mean, every football coach I ever had, he yelled at me. And I think every one of them was trying to give me information to make me better. Finally, you're at the hall of fame. Uh, You're one of 300 plus people in the hall of fame in the history of football, the world, there's 300 people walking this planet and you're one of them. Um, I there have been a lot of emotional moments uh, for v- a variety of players. When you go back to the Hall of Fame like you are today, where does it take you? What do you think about? Do you think of mom? Do you think of your family? Where does it take you emotionally? It's, I'm really shocked that I'm in the room and that I spend the time, the intimate time with the greatest players that ever played. Um, you, you said, yes, I'm on that list. But being in the room and just having small talk with them, that's probably the most profound thing that happens. And then seeing where the hall is, the state of the hall, um, how they've refurbished it, the field, everything. I mean, it's a magnificent place to be. Um, As we say, the guys in the hall, it's a great time to be in the hall of halls. And also for FS1 announcement, I'm announcing next year that we'll be doing our broadcast Thursday and Friday from the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Colin, so pass that out to your colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> His show is First Things First. It debuts September 5th after that huge college football weekend. He is a teammate. I consider him a friend uh, and sometimes a mentor, one of the smart, compelling people I've ever met. Chris, it is absolutely a pleasure for you to be a teammate. I'm, I'm happy for you in the show, and I just love talking to you every time I get the chance. Thanks, buddy. Thank you, buddy. Thanks for having me on. All right.